Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Public Works for today, Wednesday, May 29th, 2019. Commissioner Garcia, Cabello, James, and Caloza are present. President James, you do have a quorum. May we start with Bureau introductions, please, starting with Bureau of Street Lighting. Good morning, Victor Tertius, Bureau of Street Lighting. Good morning, Ron Lee, L.A. Sam. Good morning, Mike Cirillo, Bureau of Engineering. Good morning, Steffi Wiles, Bureau of Contract Administration. Good morning, Abram Tejeda, Bureau of Street Services. Good morning, Ted Jordan, Public Works General Counsel. Fernando Campos, Executive Officer. President James, we do not have any speaker cards under general public comment. We do not have any commentary under the Neighborhood Council comment section. We did receive speaker cards on item number four for today's agenda. Okay, we'll close general public comment as well as the Neighborhood Council category of commentary. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items and administrative items. There's been a request to withdraw um, agenda item number six, uh, correct, Dr. Campos? That is correct. Okay, so uh, without objection, we will withdraw uh, agenda item number six. There's some issues with the bids um, and all that, so that uh, item will be withdrawn. Agenda item number nine, specification submitted for board adoption and authorization to advertise for the invitation of bids in Council District 11. Um, for the Venice Pumping Plant Variable Frequency Drives Number 1 and 4 Replacement Project and Bologna Creek Pumping Plant Variable Frequency Drives Replacement Project. The estimate's $1,609,470. The bid receipt date is July 10, 2019. Is there a second to my motion that we adopt agenda item number 9 forthwith by Commissioner Cabello? Any objection? Without objection, we will do so. Agenda item number 10, release of a stop payment notice. Power One Engineering Incorporated is transmitting the release of a stop payment notice in the amount of $328,318.94 for labor in connection with the Donald C. Tillman Water Reclamation Plant Electrical Power System Modifications Project. The primary contractor for the project is KDC, doing business as Dyn Electric. Is there a second to my motion that we receive agenda item number 10 forthwith by Commissioner Garcia? Any objection? Without objection, we will do so. Agenda item number 11 is the release of a stop payment notice. Dean Vesoski Contractors Incorporated is transmitting the release of a stop payment notice in the amount of $96,849.46 for labor and slurry, rebar materials, excavation around pipes, traffic control, and an equipment pad in connection with the Donald C. Tillman Water Reclamation Plant Electrical Power System Modifications Project. The primary contractor is KDC doing business as Dyn Electric. Is there a motion, is there a second to my motion that we receive agenda item number 11 forthwith by Commissioner Garcia? Any objection? Without objection, we will do so. Agenda item number 12 is a stop payment notice. Traffic Loops Crack Filling Incorporated, specific, is transmitting a stop payment notice in the amount of $38,898.73 for furnishing work, labor, services, equipment, or material of the kind generally described as install of temporary and permanent type D, type E, and bike loop detectors in connection with the Machado Lake Pipeline Project. The primary contractor is Mike Bubalo Construction Incorporated. Is there a second to my motion that we receive agenda item number 12 forthwith by Commissioner Caloza? Any objection? Without objection, we will do so. Um, agenda item Number one is uh, revise, this is Bureau of Engineering, Council District 4, revise task for solicitation, task for solicitation number 280, that's a toss, to Mia Lehrer and Associates, uh, recommending that the board authorize the city engineer to issue a revision of the task for solicitation number 280 to me, MLA, that's Mia Lehrer and Associates, increasing the budget authority from $141,000 to $200,000, a $59,000 increase for architectural and engineering design services for the Griffith Park Horticultural Learning Center. Um, and uh, so whoever our representative is for number one. Mr. Drucker, that's you today. That's me. Well, Good morning, Commissioners. Neil Drucker, Bureau of Engineering. Uh, as President James indicated, this is a request to increase the TOS authority for Mia Lira and Associates for the Griffith Park Horticultural Center project design from the current 141,000 to a total of 200,000 and 
uh, no, excuse me, $200,000 even, I'm sorry. Uh, this is due to requested additional work on the part of our client, the Department of Recreation and Parks, as well as an extended public comment and public participation period, just to let you know, during the course of early design, we wanted, uh, as did our client, to expand the overall project and applied for some state funding. The requirement for that state funding was that we hold a minimum of five community meetings for the project. So that was not part of the consultant's original task. So in addition to some additional design work they had to do, they assisted in preparing the application and also participated in all five meetings. So this is to reflect their additional scope of services. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Drucker on number one? I'll make a motion that we adopt agenda item number one, seconded by Commissioner Coloza. Any objection? Thank you, Mr. Drucker. Thank you. Without objection, we'll adopt agenda item number one. Any issue sending number one forthwith? We will send number one forthwith. Is there a second to my motion that we approve the meeting minutes from the meeting of Wednesday, April 17th, 2019 by Commissioner Cabello? Any objection? Without objection, we will approve the meeting minutes. Um, agenda item. Number eight, authority for expenditure of toxic substance control. The Bureau of Engineering and Office of Accounting are requesting board approval and execution of an authority for expenditure in the amount of an additional $34,731.30 for a total adjusted amount of $82,538.39 to pay for environmental site assessment fees. Mr. Johnson. Good morning, Chris Johnson with the Bureau of Engineering. Uh, this AFE uh, authority for expenditure is for the benefit of the Taylor Yard G2 project in Council District 1. Um, the Department of Toxic Substance Control is providing oversight, their oversight agency for the site assessment and uh, development of a remedial action plan for the 42-acre site. Uh, this specific uh, uh, expenditure is for services provided uh, between October and December of 2018. Um, I can take any questions if you like. Uh, Commissioner Cabello has made a motion that we adopt agenda item number eight, seconded by Commissioner Davis. Any objection? Without objection, we'll adopt agenda item number eight. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any issues sending number eight forthwith? We will send number eight forthwith. Um, agenda item number three, council district, actually, um, yeah, agenda item number three is council district number nine, a tree removal at 515 West 31st Street. Uh, Dr. Compass, we do not receive any speaker cards on number three, correct? That is correct. Uh, recommending that the board find that the project is categorically exempt under Article 3, Section 1, Class 32 of the City's Environmental Quality Act guidelines. There's no substantial evidence the proposed project will have a significant effect on the environment and is in compliance with CEQA. Secondly, find that none of the exceptions to the use of the categorical exemption as set forth in Section 15300.2 of State CEQA guidelines applied. Third, specify that the Bureau of Street Services, Streets LA, Urban Forestry Division, located at 1149 South Broadway, is custodian of the documents or other material that constitute the record of proceedings upon which the board's decision is based. Fourth, approve the request for a fee tree removal permit to remove one California fan palm and two Canary Island date palms. Tree replacements are required. Fifth, concur with the Bureau's determination that the site cannot feasibly accommodate all of the required replacement trees pursuant to LA Municipal Code 62.177C and authorize the tree replacement guarantee fee to satisfy the public works planting requirements so we're not sending trees to a nursery to sit. Mr. Banuelos on agenda item number three. Yes, good morning, President James. Uh, Hector Banuelos with the Bureau of Street Services, Streets LA, Urban Forestry Division. Uh, good morning, Commissioners, Bureau of Representatives, City Attorney, and Dr. Campos. Uh, the, what, what we have before us is a request to remove two Canary Island date palms and one California fan palm in order for the applicant or developer to install a large crane uh, for the construction of a seven-story, 73-unit apartment complex. 
uh, the developer determined that the crane is needed in order to provide materials uh, and, and logist logistical support for construction of this uh, development. Uh, there is a large concrete pad that is required to be installed on the public right-of-way, in addition to another concrete pad for a man lift elevator to uh, provide um, uh, the employees or the, uh, the builder's employees to access the building when it's being constructed. Uh, within the footprint of this concrete pad and the elevator, there are two palm trees that are going to be severely impacted and must be removed. In addition, to, there is one day palm adjacent to an alley next to the uh, next to this project site, which uh, will then impede uh, the um, the mobility of the crane and the safe access of hoisting of the materials to for uh, construction of the building. So the developer previously requested a permit and was granted a permit <coughs> for one palm tree for driveway access, and they did uh, seek to preserve or retain the uh, three palms. However, uh, in looking for alternatives to place the crane, there were none. Uh, they could not, uh, there's wires along the alleyway, and so they could not put the crane there for, obviously, for just uh, safety, the safe, um, the safe uh, hoisting. And so the only uh, just logical location for the crane would be on the 31st Street side in front of the building. And so there, but the trees are in the way there, though they have to be removed. Uh, okay. Um, the Anything else? Yes. The yeah. developer is going to be planting another uh, four palms there, two Canarian day palms and two California fan palms if approved. And there's uh, not enough room there to plant the... Uh, Six trees is required for the two to one, so the developer is will be required to pay the in lieu fee for a guaranteed planting of two additional trees. The uh, city department of city planning did uh, <coughs> determine that the project is categorically exempt, and the streets LA did review the uh, category exemption and determined that it does appropriately address the tree removals at the location. The uh, council district nine, California, the Community Forestry Advisory Committee and Department of Neighborhood Empowerment were informed of the tree removal permit request. Thank you. Commissioner Cavell. Thank you, President James. Um, Mr. Ben Willis, can you clarify whether or not the council office is in support of this project and is okay with these tree removals? In the board report, you always notify, you always mention who aren't notified, which we do appreciate, but it would be helpful for us to know in advance if the council office is in support of the overall project and the tree, not only the removal, but the, the remedy, if you will, the cure, the, the, the guarantee fee. Yes, the council office is in support of the project. Okay, great. If we can add that for future board reports, just so I don't have to keep bugging you during board, that would be really helpful. Sure, not a problem. Agreed. Yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, because sometimes I hear from the council offices and my colleagues down here and they don't know necessarily that I hear. So, um, okay. Um, and, and so just, I'm doing my math. Uh, Mr. Benuelos, so they're putting, we're taking three out, um, they're putting how many in? They're putting in four. Okay, so the two are the ones that they're, that they're paying the tree replacement fee on. Yes, uh, also as I previously mentioned, they did receive a permit for one palm tree at the time when they received the permit. Uh, they were intending on uh, retaining the three trees. And at that time, it was, there was no room for the tree replants because those trees were there. Okay. Uh, and the one tree request would be done administratively. It doesn't come before the board. Is but, but once you get over three trees, it does. Yes, yes. The one tree was, uh, was permitted administratively. And they did pay a cash of uh, the uh, tree planting guarantee in lieu fee as well. Okay. Um, and just because it's still new... The tree replacement fee concept, what we do with that, that those funds are then paid, the, the Bureau maintains that fund to, and uses it to replant trees in adjacent areas, particularly areas that are canopy poor, correct? Yes, but then the respective council district. Right. That's correct. Uh, even though they're not successful on the two to one here, well, they are if you add the tree replacement fee, but they're taking out three but replanting four, correct? That's correct. Um, uh, so I'll make a motion that we adopt agenda item number three, seconded by Commissioner Cabello and Commissioner Garcia. Um, uh, any objection? Without objection, we'll adopt agenda item number three. Um, any issues sending number three forthwith? We will send number three forthwith. Uh, thank you, sir. 
Okay, that's thank the you. end of the generally straightforward items. So, oh, well, no, no, I forgot which one that one may not be. Um, but that may be where I go next. Um, agenda item number seven, Council District 13. It's a good start, though. Contract award, capital improvement project, 4178, Los Angeles-Glendale Water Reclamation Plant, dechlorination chamber improvements, capital improvement project, LAGWRP sodium bisulfate facility improvements, um, and that's LA Glendale Water Reclamation Plant, LAGWRP cover plates and grading replacement. Uh, recommending that the board find Metro Builders and Engineers Group Limited Metro Builders, the first low bidder to be non responsive as discussed in the report. Secondly, declare Green Building Corporation, the second low bidder to be the lowest responsive responsible bidder, and award Green a contract for the project for four million. $186,965, and third, authorize myself or two members of the Board of Public Works to execute the contract after approval as to form has been obtained from the city attorney. Uh, Dr. Campos, no speaker cards on this one? That is correct, no speaker cards. Uh, Mr. Cirillo on number seven. Okay, good morning. Mike Cirillo with the Bureau of Engineering. Uh, this is the three projects you referenced at uh, LA Gen Glendale Water Reclamation Plant. We combined three projects into one <coughs> contract and sent it out to bids. Uh, we received uh, two bids on this contract. I'll give you a little uh, uh, background of what, this, uh, what these projects are going to do. For the first one, CIP 4178, um, the bisulfite facility is used to dechlorinate the water before it gets discharged into the LA River. Um, so there's a baffle system ins inside of the uh, dechlorination facility that needs to be rebuilt. So the first project will rebuild that with a stainless steel baffle system because the wood baffle system that was in there previously is now rotten and ready to be replaced. Uh, the next uh, contract, 4179, is actually working on the bisulfite facility itself. Uh, we're going to install some new res recirculation pumps, some heat tracing, and also tie it into the new di distributed control system. And the last project, CIP 4189, is to replace some uh, corroded grating and cover plates. Um, this is a safety issue because uh, uh, staff walks on these uh, uh, facilities, so they need to be replaced to make sure they're safe for staff to, to walk on. Um, so as I mentioned, we received two bids on February 13th. The city engineer's estimate was $4,048,911. Um, one of the bids came in about 4.65% below the city engineer's estimate. The other bid was about 3.41% above the city engineer's estimate. Um, the low bidder, uh, oh, sorry, before I get to that, um, I'll speak a little bit on the local business preference as well. Um, uh, OCC evaluated the local uh, uh, business preference ordinance against both uh, bidders. And both of them received uh, a discount. Green received an 8% discount, uh, and uh, Metro received a 1%. When you apply those discounts, the bid order did not change, so the order of the bid stays the same, even after the local business preference. The issue here is that the minimum sub requirement uh, for the contract was 25%, and uh, the, the apparent low bidder, Metro Builders, failed to meet the 25% MSM. Um, they did not list... Um, on their sub uh, sub consultant uh, utilization form, uh, they listed all their subs. They listed um, dollar amounts near next to all their subs, with the exception of one. Uh, La Habra Fire uh, Protection and Plumbing was listed on their sub form, but there was no dollar amount listed, so we could not calculate any number for them in the MSM. When you uh, do the calculations, the MSM for them is 24 percent in lieu of 20, 25 percent, and therefore. Um, uh, they're deemed non-responsive because they failed to meet the MSM. They were contacted and claimed that there was a clerical error, that they failed to write the, the dollar amount on the bid form. Uh, however, staff has no way to verify uh, that information. Um, so uh, that being the case, um, um, OCC deemed them to be non-responsive. It did not even do a BIP review of that, that first low bidder. They went to the second bidder, concluded their BIP uh, outreach review, and they did pass the BIP outreach review. So. In conclusion, um, uh, with the failure of meeting the MSM and then the second low bidder passing the BIP outreach, our recommendation is towards the second bidder, Green Building. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cirillo. Ms. McGlinchey? And I have a couple of questions on this. Um, so, recognizing there's about $300,000 difference between the two, um, uh, I, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking through... Um, how we don't spend the three hundred thousand, um, so or save the three hundred thousand, I should say. Um, so the 
the bid sheet uh, left a blank for one of the subs. I saw the bid sheet. There's a blank there. What do, what's the ramification of that as the project goes along? Does that provide them with potentially some leeway that is not necessarily what BCA likes to see? Is there some concern about that? Um, uh, when you go back and try and close out a contract, the, you know, I, what, what is BCA, what does that mean to BCA? Good morning. Uh, it does leave the contractor with a lot of wiggle room, if you would, in that our uh, business inclusion program holds contractors to the subcontractors and the dollar amounts they list for those subcontractors uh, at the end of the project. So if we're recommending a penalty, it's based on what they were bid listed for the dollar amount. By failing to put in a dollar amount, that allows the contractor to perhaps go back to that subcontractor and negotiate with them to reduce the price for the work that they have been listed them for. So could that then maybe create an advantage to them? It could. Okay. Mr. Jordan, um, is this something that even if we wanted to waive, does, would the board have the authority to waive this irregularity? And what's your thought on this one? Well, I, I haven't seen the Schedule A, but if you just write the name, you, as far as I'm concerned, you have not listed a subcontractor. I mean, because there, there's plenty of times on Schedule A's, contractors have some of that stuff already in there, and then they just, they might have more than one subcontractor typed on there sometimes. And then the, the, the final moment of bidding, they, they, they opted to go with one, and then they completely they finish filling out the line and they leave the other one blank, or they scratch out a name that they haven't used. In this case, they wrote down the, con the subcontractor's name. So as far as I'm concerned, they have not listed a subcontractor, which means they can't have a subcontractor because they'll have to sell a lot for when they don't have a subcontractor okay. listed. Whether that gives them a competitive advantage, uh, it goes against our, I mean, we have an MSN for a reason. We want people to subcontract out. That's the basis that we, uh, then have the business inclusion program where they do a, a good faith effort to outreach to people who are they are subcontracting, but ultimately they were they were close they were close to meeting the MSM. Um, there is some leeway if we find that uh, listing less than what we required, whether that gives them a competitive advantage or not. I think many prime contractors would prefer to self perform things because then they're not paying certain extra costs to the subcontractors because they don't need to bake in the subcontractor's profit and all of the overhead associated with overseeing a subcontractor. Uh, at this point, I don't really know enough to know whether or not that would have given them an advantage. Uh, if the board wanted to waive the deviation, Con Ed would have to go back and then reevaluate whether that firm was even responsive because there was no review of whether they complied with the good faith effort, the, the business and conclusion program. Thank you. Yeah, you answered my next question, although Mr. Cirillo touched on that point. Um, it's, and by the way, it's not like either one of them are particularly stellar here with the MBE, WBE numbers. Um, they're a bunch of goose eggs, so as far as zeros. Uh, but that said, is there, um, I, I do notice that green is listed as an LBE. Um, uh, that's your recommended entity, correct, Mr. Cirillo? The second low bidder, green? Um, yes, they are. Okay. And so uh, did, did the LBE advantage or the LBE uh, uh, credit in any way apply here? Um, would it be applicable one way or the other, Ms. McGlinchey? So uh, we did do an analysis in terms of the local business preference program. We applied the 8% uh, preference to green. Uh, if you look on page four of your board report, it does note the, the um, adjusted bid amounts per the preference. As it happened, Metro Builders did list uh, LBE sub, which allowed them to get a 1% preference, and that's how they maintained their low bid status. Uh, one other it was really close, but they, they squeaked by. They did. Uh, one other uh, item just to mention, yes, green is LBE. They also happen to be a small business enterprise. Okay, uh, which is of note. Um, 
all right, um, uh, I, I would typically, uh, in this instance, try to artfully find a way to maybe save the $300,000 here. However, um, Mr. Jordan, your answer was a little stronger than I anticipated when you indicated that you consider it with they don't put a dollar amount as not even listing a sub to begin with. Um, my concern, though, in, in trying to save the $300,000 is we send, that would if we do that, that would send contract administration back to do an analysis of the, the BIP program. Um, and, you know, we, um, I don't know how that'll turn out. Um, it's probably going to turn out okay. But how much time would you need to do it, assuming it would even turn out okay? Uh, that, that would depend on Metro and what documentation they provide to us. It could be a week. It could be three weeks. Okay. Another concern that I have is green is a local business. The council's decided we'll spend up to a million dollars. That's the cap um, to keep local business in the game. Um, so uh, given that, I, my recommendation would be to, to stay with with uh, contract administration, but I'm happy to hear what uh, anybody else has to say. Commissioner Davis. I just wanted a better understanding of the problem. Currently, as you have assessed it, Metro Builders did not meet the SM, uh, the MSM, is that correct? Yes. Now, did Green meet the S, uh, MSM, and if so, how did it? Yes, they did. Uh, Green met the MSM with a pledge of 27.42%. Of, uh, of businesses inclusion, of, of business they, inclusion? Yes, they pledged 27.42% of their contract to subcontractors. Uh, and they did do that. <laughs> um, as uh, the president said, none of them were able to achieve any MBE and WBE on this project in, in terms of the uh, skills that are needed in construction and uh, this project certainly uh, there are firms from both categories that could certainly do this work. Uh, and certainly not being the prime contract, I don't know what happened there in terms of feedback they got or didn't get as they went through the BAP process. Uh, I certainly would love to save the $350,000 as well. Uh, but as our city attorney pointed out to us, um, I'm not clear uh, if, in fact, the fact that they named a business uh, reflects their intention to have included a business. I mean, certainly, I know as we see it in terms of data, uh, as the city attorney stated, uh, a figure should have been listed and it was not. But then at the same time, there was some writing of a subcontract uh, and could that reflect their intention to do so? Uh, meaning that having looked at that, uh, would the board believe in any way that uh, their, act, their, their, their assessment or their testimony that they had a clerical error and failed to put it down there? I don't know what that means. Uh, but uh, the fact that they did list a subcontractor, does that reflect their intention in any way to have included it? I mean, there was some writing there on that line of a, of a small business. And I know it's not within the, the operating uh, values of what we do, but but that's something to, to look at. Not really. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you're asking me a question. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kind of thinking out loud about the fact that while I understand they did not put a figure, because we deal in numbers, that's what business is about, it's about numbers. So I recognize that there was a failure there. But on the other hand, there was a listing of a name of a small business that really is a small business that really does exist, could that in any way uh, be considered their intention, even though they made an error? It possibly could, but in that respect too, as proof of the dollar amount that they had intended there, they gave us a, uh, what was supposed to be a screenshot of a text message, which was sent at, I believe, about 9.34 a.m., which was more than sufficient time to take that information and enter it onto their bid documents. Okay, 
So they and they didn't. Yeah, they and they did that. not. Yeah. I see. Okay. Uh, they did. I do appreciate the fact that they at least attempted to give us uh, a figure that was under the estimate. Um, but, you know, it is, I guess, what it is at this point. But uh, that's certainly something for us uh, uh, to look at. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Part of the concern I have, uh, and Ms. McGlinch, you referenced yesterday uh, in our conversation um, that you had with me this, the evidence that they point to that uh, indicated an amount that they were going to include. The problem is what you just said, if, they, if there was plenty of time for them to do so, you never know what happened in that, in that intervening time period. We don't have anything before us. They knew about the hearing this morning, correct? Okay, I know that Green knows about it because Green uh, sent a representative this morning uh, who's here if you have any questions for Green. But, um, but giving them uh, the opportunity, um, uh, you never know what happened in that period of time that resulted in maybe them, maybe it was a clerk letter, maybe not. Um, uh, so, um, I, I, again, um, while I would like to save $300,000 here, um, uh, given the LBE status of green, um, Mr. Jordan's statements on um, the way to uh, view the missing number, um, uh, I'm going to make a motion that we, uh, and the fact that if we send contract administration back, we don't know how long it will take for them to do the business inclusion process analysis, program analysis. Um, I'm going to recommend that we uh, follow the Bureau's recommendation. Um, on agenda item number seven, seconded by Commissioner Davis and Commissioner Garcia. Any objection? Uh, without objection, that'll be the order on agenda item number seven. It will go to green. Um, thank you, Ms. McGlinchey. Thank you, Mr. Cirillo. Any issue sending number seven forthwith? We will send number seven forthwith. Um, all right. Uh, let's go to number Four, um, we have uh, Dr. Campos. Do we have what do we have? Three items left. We have item number two, four, five, and thirteen. Oh, uh, yeah. So we have the oral report. But the, okay, so we have three voting items left. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and go to number four because we have all these are going to be potentially lengthy, but we have speaker cards number four, so we'll take them first. Um, agenda item number four is a contract amendment various OCB contractors recommending that the board authorize the Office of Community Beautification to execute an amendment to contract numbers. And, and there were a number of them. Two through eight were adopted by the board on Friday, May 24, 2019. Uh, number one, which is contract number C-122516 with Central City Action Committee in the amount of $50,000 was held on the table for a hearing this morning. Um, Mr. Roch, could I um, have you come forward before we have our uh, speaker cards, because I know that we um, uh, have representatives from CCAC here, that Central City Action Committee, and we have a representative from the Chinatown bid here. Um, I'm going to let you summarize, but I'm going to try and, and send you in the direction that I've, to save us maybe some time. Um, this is uh, not to award a new contract, is it? No, it's not. Okay. So we have an existing contract in place. This would be to execute an amendment to the contract to provide $50,000. Is it additional funding? Yes. It, okay. it would be an additional $50,000. Additional $50,000 for what? For the hiring of uh, summer youth workers to supplement the work of the uh, graffiti abatement contractor. Um, every summer we set aside some funding so that various contractors can hire youth from the local communities to go out and do a lot of work um, that the regular graffiti crews just don't have time to do. Pulling down a lot of the illegally posted signs on uh, light poles, uh, cleaning up uh, uh, stickers off traffic control boxes, um, helping with graffiti removal, helping with the public right away cleanup, um, all those types of OCB. Um, services is just uh, a way of really doing two things, providing additional uh, jobs to youth in the community and providing an enhanced level of services. Okay, so 
um, during uh, Friday's hearing, um, and feel free, Ms. Raj, to correct me, uh, and Commissioner Coloza can correct me as well, um, there was, as I recall, discussion, um, and we had Mr. Yu here um, uh, on Friday, uh, who spoke along with, um, uh, with another representative from the Chinatown bid, uh, with um, uh, some informational complaints regarding matching of paint, and there may have been other, some other complaints as well, but what I remember more specifically was matching of paint in connection with uh, some of the repair, which I'll call repair work. Um, and so uh, we decided to hold this uh, to this morning to give CCAC a chance to respond, and we wanted to um, give uh, the representative from the Chinatown bid the opportunity to kind of put their uh, complaints on the, the record again here this morning so we can make a determination regarding this request for the additional $50,000. Before I call up uh, Mr. Yu, um, uh, Mr. Roch, um, anything further, and Commissioner Kloza, if you have any questions for um, uh, Mr. Roch before we go to the speakers, I'm going to then I'm going to open it up for the floor as well for the for the five of uh, for the four of you after I finish. But is there anything, Mr. Roch, from Friday's hearing that you want to add to carry over to today before we proceed well, further? Yeah, yeah, just a couple things very quickly. Um, first, you know, I I don't disagree with the fact that there uh, is room for improvement on the work that CCAC has been doing. Their color matching um, was not up to what we would like to see. There's no disagreement about that. I, I think CCAC will agree with that as well. Uh, the Chinatown area has a number of challenges. Um, there's a lot of construction in the area. It's a very dense area with a lot of traffic. And so when the contractor goes in, in a lot of cases, it's very challenging to get to the location they have to do. And that's just, you know, a particular, you know, kind of issue in the area. Obviously, we've discussed in the past prevailing wage and the amount of time that contractors have to get out there. So I think that in, in the need to kind of keep up with the quantity of the work they were doing, the quality suffered. Um, and, and they have demonstrated uh, in the past two weeks a, an improvement in that. They have gone out and uh, color matched a lot of the walls and got them back onto a standardized color. Um, and, you know, I believe that, that depriving them of funding to hire summer youth not only will have a negative uh, impact on the youth, but would also uh, have an impact on the work that they could be performing in Chinatown, in Pico Union, in Westlake, in Elysian Valley, in the whole portion of Council District 1 that CCAC services. Okay, thank you, Mr. Roch. Um, any questions, colleagues, for Mr. Roch? Anything, any points you want to make before we go to the speakers? Okay, uh, uh, so uh, uh, colleagues are going to wait till after Mr. Roch, so thank you, sir. Yes. Um, Mr. Yu, um, we have your speaker card, and um, just so you all know, is Mr. Yu here? Oh, okay. Um, just so, oh, there you, there you are. Um, given the this type of hearing, um, I don't put a time limit on uh, the stakeholders from either side, but what I do ask, just in, um, in regards to the fact that we have additional um, uh, agenda items this morning um, and everyone's time and with everyone's time in mind, uh, I, I will start to step in if you start to repeat yourself um, uh, and we're not getting any more substantive information that we haven't already heard. Uh, Mr. Yu, go ahead, sir. Uh, my name is George Yu. I'm the executive director of the Chinatown Business Improvement District. Um, as directed by Fernando, I've also printed out three sets of photos um, for you to see. Um, I'm not opposing the funding to CCAC to hire youth during the summer. I'm also appreciative of my um, open request. That I think there was nine open graffiti requests from Friday haven't been abated as of yesterday. They have been? Yes. Okay. And the additional efforts made over the past few weeks. The photos sent to Fernando and the ones sitting there um, are of 1200 North Spring Street, 
14 to 1700 block of North Spring Street, 14 to 1500 block of North Broadway and 765 West College Street. All of them show the gray green paint that did not happen overnight. It's been a consistent pattern of um, using that color. There's no efforts made, minimal efforts made to match because you can clearly see from the photos and con the contract needs to be performed at some capacity. Things are not perfect, I fully realize that. But this is not the answer and going down this direction that we've gone. I have emails going back 10 years, well, excuse me, since 2012 to um, OCB about performance. I gave up prior to being asked to come and talk about this, but the ball is in your court. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you coming and representing your bid. Um, so um, regarding uh, Central City Action Committee, I've got a number of speakers. I really, um, uh, it, you can speak in whatever order you would prefer. I don't know if you have a uh, someone that's a central speaker, um, and then you want to add others. It really is up to uh, up to you all. Um, and before, uh, one, one moment, ma'am, uh, uh, as you as you approach. Um, Commissioner Coloza um, uh, and, and the rest of my colleagues, so I, I do want, we did hear Mr. Yu indicate that he um, does not oppose uh, the $50,000 uh, for the, um, to, to be spent on uh, the uh, hiring of additional youth during the, is it during the summer, Mr. Roch? Yes. Okay during the summer. Um, so uh, we can keep that on the table to the extent um, uh, our board wants to, um, but w the dispute that I'm hearing now, and you may feel differently, but the dispute that I'm hearing now, and I don't, it may not even be a dispute, but the issue that I'm hearing, may be better phrased, is that we have, uh, the, the bid is unsatisfied with the paint matching and has had some complaints for some time regarding that primarily. And so this is uh, an opportunity for uh, uh, CCAC um, to respond accordingly. And I know Mr. Roch had indicated that there have been some other issues over the years. So uh, if anything, this is an opportunity for us um, to have a discussion with our contractor um, about providing uh, work that's satisfactory to everyone that they're, that they're serving. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, I'm the executive director, Marianne Hayashi of Central City Action Committee, and we, uh, we put a map up here. We cover, uh, it's a large area. We cover, we, do, we move graffiti in 14 neighborhoods. And actually, I was going to come here and, and preach in defense of the kids and tell you how wonderful they are and all the wonderful things they do in the community. But I just, really they do, both city council, uh, uh, Offices are always calling us. They want our kids. We want CCAC kids because they know what they're doing. They have experience and we do a lot of volunteer work not only in their own neighborhoods, but all over. But I will let Dave, I think the issue is we want to deal with the problems we have down there. Now we know we have problems. I live in Chinatown. I've been a resident there since 1949. I don't think half the people up here were born in 49. I went to school. I went to high school there. You do the math, you know. <laughs> I went to a Catholic high school there. My uh, brothers and nephews went to Cathedral High School. I'm a member of St. Anthony's Croatian Catholic Church. It's still up in Chinatown. And we have had issues in Chinatown, and it's not only graffiti. Chinatown has changes. Uh, you, we have events, and it's good that the bid is bringing in these events, but we have events in Chinatown, uh, Union Station, Alvaro Street, uh, the State Park, and you know, the social media, through the social media, people are coming in, lining up to buy chicken. They're lining up to do all kinds of things. So, it's, so as a result, it's unfortunate that these events also attract an element that's hard on our furniture. Uh, up in the hill where we live, the neighbors, the seniors having problems. We, there's scooters. We have additional trash. And so there, there's a lot of things happening in, in, in the Chinatown area. Now, we... We have always addressed the graffiti 
number one, get in there. Get the gang, get the gang graffiti down, the 311 request, and do the proactive. But when you have an event and people come in and they put a thousand stickers on walls and on poles and they tie them up and you have to take them down. So we are proactive and then we've got, and of course our quality has gone down. And so in the last, since we met with the, with the commissioner, uh, David will address some of the things, things. We have a plan. Now with this whole area, we have five full-time staff and two part-time. So now we've had to deal with volunteers and luckily, we have your youth program. The young man you, we see here today, they've been they volunteered and have been in Chinatown uh, since we met with the commissioner, re helping with the stickers and, and removing things like that. So we know we have to have a plan. We have to have a better plan, color matching. But I think if we just can all sit down at the table and agree, you know, on the color match, and David's going to explain, we've had some problems with our color match unit, but we've been working, we've been getting great support from OCB, from, uh, from their staff and our monitors helping us with these, some of these things. We've made these uh, problems known before. We've had the west end of Chinatown, we have these, uh, they've had these graffiti uh, shows and they attract all these people in to buy graffiti and they, uh, some of the warehouses commissioned artists to put all this graffiti on walls and then we've got people screaming at us, get the graffiti off the walls and they're saying, no, it's art. So, you know, we've had all these problems. So it's, it's really slowed us down. But uh, we're working closely with Paul and our monitors and we're trying to see if we could rectify this. But uh, please fund our summer youth program. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Commissioner Davis, do you have a question I before do. we move? Ms. Yes. Ms. Yashi, if you uh, you spoke briefly about uh, color coding, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, matching, matching. Um, could you tell me how matching takes place? Uh, oh. Is it something that originates with your agency or are there instructions no, given I'll, I'll to I'll turn this over to David Bermudez. David Bermudez is the staff that runs our graffiti removal projects and supervises the youth. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Bermudez, we have your speaker card. Go ahead, sir. President James, commissioners. My name is David Bermudez. I'm the coordinator of our agency for graffiti abatement. And in regards to your question for color matching, the department uh, has equipped us, funded uh, a color match system with software, portable meter to go out and take readings. Um, over the years, our original equipment became obsolete. Uh, we acquired new equipment through OCB. Um, the last thing that happened was that our vendor was bought out. So it's a matter of having a formulary software to mix colors. So we've been using um, records that we have for colors from pre previous color matches. Uh, we are in the process of discussing with one vendor we work with if they can supply material and, and software to do this again with the meter. Um, Frazee Paints, for example, was bought out by Sher Sherwin-Williams. Frazee was a software the city provided, and so that's uh, obsolete now. So would it be fair to say that the agency is responsible for uh, matching? Yes, yes. So each agency is responsible for color matching. And they do it differently. Different agencies match by eye with tints and they you know, mix on the spot and, and we were fortunate enough to be funded for that equipment. In fact, we were the first agency to be uh, afforded that uh, in the early years. We've been at this for over 25 years. So you've had a shortage of appropriate equipment to do matching, correct? The equipment is there. It's the vendors, the manufacturers that um, they're in the industry. There's paint companies being bought out by others. So oh, once they, the that machine. happens, then is the, it the machine or is it its equipment? How long has the equipment been in disrepair? Would you say it's not in disrepair? Okay, what's it's, wrong? With it's uh, software to go with uh, the equipment, and this software contains a formulary to to give you formulas to mix colors. Sure. Uh, that is uh, uh, proprietary by each vendor. So um, when they go out of business or they get bought out parent company just, you know, um, does away with that. How itself. long has it been since we've had this gap in the appropriate software or whatever? Uh, the a few months now with the last vendor, uh, Frazee, um, a 
roughly six months. Okay, so for six months we've had this problem, correct? I've been um, matching through old records and uh, similar colors that we have. Um, I, d I don't mean to use this as an excuse, but the, the program says that we will match, and it's not always 100% of match, but the property owner has the, uh, the option to provide the color, the exact color, so that we can paint for them. Um, Two things I want to find out. The first one is, what we do is match when we provide the service. Is that true? Is that our expectation? Is that what we're seeking to deliver? Is that our goal? To well, we want to restore. We want to restore the color, so yes. That but my question is, is it our goal to match? Is that what we're seeking to produce yes, yes. to the citizens? When we provide a service, is it expected that our service will include matching? Is that correct? Expected by Do you the not public? Okay, let me ask you it this way. When you go out to the deliver the service, it doesn't matter if you do matching or not. Is that correct? Well, you know, different walls, different neighborhoods. So uh, yes or no, it doesn't matter whether we match or not. It matters when we are restoring, but when we have walls in neighborhoods such as Westlake, Pico Union, mm -hmm. where they're chronically graffitied, then it doesn't we, matter. we match with our standard color. So we have a standard palette of about 10 colors from a gray to a chocolate to a brick red, a black, a white, and we will match that wall day after day after day because of the, the, the hot spot that it is. So in the last scenario that you mentioned, does it not matter that you match? I'm trying to figure out. It matters, yes, because uh, so the appearance, overall appearance of the neighborhood is so affected by. In the service you're providing to our constituents, it does matter to you as an agency oh, that yes. the paint matches, correct? Yes. So if it matters, we've had a problem for six months, mm -hmm. correct? Right. And how long do you think it takes for us to correct the problem that we've had for six months? Well, um, I'm speaking to one vendor right now. It could be. But my question is, how long would it take anyone, let's say another agency for that matter, based upon your experience, how long does it take to correct the problem of all of materials you need equipment you need to match? How long does it take to correct that particular problem? If the vendors are cooperative, if uh, the cost of that software is not prohibitive, then we can purchase it and then we have to change over the, the product, the stock but currently that we Currently it has taken us six months to come to some recognition that this is a problem, correct? It's taken us six months. Is what you well, all things, all situations that, that, are, that I'm describing, yes. Within that six months, could it have been corrected, the problem? It, it possibly could have been corrected. So it's possible that in six months it could not have been corrected? Right. You're saying it could not have been corrected in, cor in six months? I'm saying you said it could be and that it couldn't be. I'm saying it could have been, yes. It could have been corrected within yes. the six months? If. So if it could have been corrected within the six months, we were not able to get it. Why do you think we weren't able to correct it within the time period that we could have corrected it? So in other words, I'm understanding you that within this six months, we could have already corrected this problem, but we didn't. Why do you think we didn't? Um, getting follow-up with the vendors, communication with the vendors, consistent communication with the vendors to agree to, to sell the formulary. New, you know, for a new product line. Were there any financial barriers to us achieving that task? Because the task of contacting and communicating with the vendors was something that rests clearly on the administrators of the program, correct? Right. There was no financial barriers in that task, in performing that task, so that then the contact with the vendors was the major task to be done to complete this problem, is what you've testified. Why did it take us so long to do that? Uh, just uh, preoccupation with other tasks in the office and in the field. So if we have preoccupation with other, ta uh, other things in the office, would you say that matching is a priority for the organization? It is, it is. So if it's a, a priority for the organization and it's taken us six months and it could have been achieved, the correction could have been achieved within six months, and we didn't do it, and today you testified that there were other priorities in the office, was it really a priority? It's kind of a 
across the board with all the other tasks that I that I handle, purchasing and vehicle maintenance and equipment. Uh, I may be building. missing something, but based upon what you're saying, and I'm going to conclude, uh, Commissioner, uh, based upon what I'm hearing you say, it's a question about how much of a priority matching really is, at least for your agency. Okay. Uh, you know, and as I described earlier, different communities, different neighborhoods have different demands based on the activity. So some neighborhoods um, we maintain with our standard palette of colors because of the frequency. Um, other walls, other locations, we have color matches established and we maintain them with the colors that we have previously matched. I think one of the purposes of the hearing today is that we can all discover that one of the priorities of the board of this commission is that matching takes place. And that's the purpose of this hearing. So I'm unclear about the mixed messages that may have been sent to the agency in the past. But I think that this particular meeting in and of itself should serve as notification to your agency that matching is important sure. and that it is a priority for this particular commission. Uh, and that we expect that to happen. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Commissioner Cavell? Just briefly, I know that we might want to have some additional folks from CCAC testify, and I will definitely have more comments and questions afterwards. I'm going to ask Mr. Rauch to come on up. But to your point, uh, Commissioner Davis, we might want to consider something Mr. Bermuda said, which is that the city is to provide the appropriate software or has traditionally done so. So it may not all, the onus may not all be on CCAC. So after we've concluded public comment, I'd like Mr. Rauch to address that so as not to just put the complete burden on CCAC and just cut, let, let's get some clarification on that later but I know we have additional speakers so I'd like to let I'd like to hear from them so uh, if I may just thank sure. you for the funding thus far and uh, you can see that in, in this geographic map here from Elysian Valley all the way down to Pico Yim to the 10 freeway this is where all this work occurs by these young men and women that are paid by this funding uh, we surveyed these neighborhoods, the major thoroughfares, including Chinatown, Westlake, Echo Park. We go through all those boulevards and we detail all the poles and bring them back up to standard. And this is what they're paid for. So it's a program that covers the entire contract area, not just one neighborhood. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, is I've got also, I have Oscar Rojas, uh, Luis Rivera, um, uh, the last name is Sorto. I can't read the first name. And Brandon Sorto. Hi. Uh, good morning, Board President and Commissioners. My name is Oscar Rojas, and I'm, uh, I've been with CCAC since uh, 2014, volunteering. And um, with the funding that we've been provided, I started working in summer 2014. And so basically what we do is uh, we help out the graffiti staff who are um, out there getting all the major graffitis, but because of the traffic and all the activity in the street, they don't always get the opportunity to walk on the streets and get all the poles. So that's where we kind of like help out a lot. We remove all the stickers. We uh, get the poles that they miss. Sometimes the graffiti is too small for them to um, identify, and it's not always requested. So after they get the priority graffiti out, we kind of like just go in and like do like get all the small stuff, make it match, and also we do community cleanups. So like last summer, we, we did a lot of community cleanups with um, the, um, I believe it was the Mitchell Ferrell. And we, we walked through and we basically pick up all the trash and it, we, are, we also deal with like safety procedures where sometimes we encounter like needles or, or like sharp glass and we, you know, we try to get it all out the way. And um, another thing that I want to mention is that this program is really flexible for students. I myself am a student at Casa LA and I'm a dreamer. And having this program has helped me work my schedule with school and work. So I just want to thank you guys for the funding we've gotten so far and have a good day. Thank you for coming in, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning, um, Board President James and Commissioners. My name is uh, Luis Rivera, and just like uh, my fellow um, Oscar was saying, that the program helps me out too. I'm also a, a student. I go to, I go to school in Riverside, and the 
funny that um, CCAC has, Academy has tried me for to pay for books and help my, help my family out like in any ways possible. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Board of Hockey members and uh, Board President James. Um, I'm, I've been working with the CCAC for about uh, four to five years. And um, it's um, really, uh, and as a full-time student and um, as someone with a part-time job, the flexibility of the job like really helps me, um, it really helps me gain um, more. Um, it really helps with um, the amount of money uh, that I can help with, like that helps me cost, um, cover more expenses like rent because I live in a part um, of town that, you know, where the rent is rising and, um, you know, books and uh, tuition and, you know, and, and basic needs like food body uh, bodily thing. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming in this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning, board president, James and commissioners. My name is Christian Sorto and that was my brother. We're both Christian. Got it. Got it. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I was going to guess that, but <laughs> go ahead. Uh, this summer program has benefited me a lot, especially for my family, since my parents aren't documented, they're unable to get the jobs that they want, and this is a way of helping them, especially through the hardships of, of how what's going on in this country at the moment. And especially for me, I go to Cal State Chico, all the way up north, so I have no one with me, and this is a way to help me pay rent, expenses, uh, anything that has to do with school. And it's uh, it's just been a great time. It's it's like a family here. We always get along. We do not have problems. And you, as you can see, the heat is getting worse and worse and worse. But every time we still go out there and we do our best, we take out all the stickers, even though it's the, the easy ones or the hard ones, we try our best. And the poles, the poles are not as easy because there's different ones. But we, we always try our best to make the community look nice because every time I look at the community, and I see that the there's there's no graffiti. It makes it makes people be like, "Oh, look, LA looks nice," because everybody comes to LA, tourists and all of that. So I always think about, "Oh, if we make the community looks nice, then it makes more people think that we're good people instead of thinking that we're nasty, dirty, or like more like yeah." But as in in reality, like I just love this program and. I enjoy working with them. They're, re they're really great people and they care about us, so might as well just do the same for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shorto. So um, those are all the speaker cards I have on record, I think. Um, I know we have two of the principals here as well. Mr. Roch? Um, I've got Commissioner Cabello, then Commissioner Garcia. Uh, Commissioner Garcia, then Commissioner Cabello. Commissioner Garcia. Um, I was going to wait till we kind of, kind of conclude it, but I, I can, do you have questions? I just wanted oh, yeah. to address Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So earlier we heard Mr. Bermudez, sir, um, reference the paint matching uh, software and he said the city had provided it. Is that part of the contract and part of our obligation to provide them with certain types of software and when those vendors go out of business updating that? How does that work? Can you explain that process for us? Because that might help clarify some of Commissioner Davis's comments. Yeah. So um, utilizing the funding that they get through the OCB contract, um, OCB contractors do purchase the color matching software, almost like you would see at Home Depot, where you could um, have a little, you know, kind of spectrophotometer thing you can put on the wall or bring in a color chip and match the color of paint. Um, so, so contractors do have that through the funding uh, that they receive from OCB. I think the thing here was they were with one company, the company went out of business, the formulas changed, and you know, for whatever reason, they didn't get the new software for the new formulas. One clarification I want to make, there was some differential here, you know, when Dave was talking about not color matching, I think he was kind of referring to not actually, you know, mixing up a special brand of paint, like if you see 
a, a gray wall or something like that. In a lot of cases, you know, it's a lot quicker and less expensive to use the standardized gray that the contractors have. They all have, you know, a light gray, a dark gray, a white, an off-white, and, and there's a differential. They're still matching the color of the wall. It might not be to 100%. We don't provide enough funds to any of our contractors that they're able to 100% match the color of a wall. But they should all be getting within that, you know, what we don't want to see is white paint going on a beige wall or a gray wall or, or a weird colored green or anything like that. Um, and then just one more comment in talking to these four gentlemen in the yellow vest in the back. All of them are members of the community. All of them are college students. You know, the one guy mentioned he went to Cal State Chico, one goes to Cal State LA, another one goes to Riverside, and yet they're, they're coming back to their neighborhoods during the summer, hoping, expecting to have a job that they can work in their communities to improve their communities and also to earn some money that they're able to assist their families with and to pay their educational expenses. Understood, yep. and I don't think that anybody wants to hold these young men hostages. These, the flexibility that allows the communities where they come from, the trajectory that on which they're on, and their way, and the manner in which they're allowed and participate in making our communities better. I don't think that's on the table. I think we've discussed that already. My issue, though, and there's a couple of things I want to point out, is there is a difference between putting light gray on a beige wall and putting white on a blue wall, right? And I think. I'm not so much holding account, or blaming is not the right word, but I'm not so much putting the onus on CCA, CCAC as I am wondering what we as a city, what we as OCB, what we as the Board of Public Works do to ensure that if you see this kind of discrepancy happening, even if it's only over a six month period or maybe longer according to Mr. Yu, I'm not sure who's correct, I haven't been out there, what are we doing? to help them, How, what, are we do, what are we providing, what support or what conditions are we doing to hold them to account to make sure that they're adhering to our, their contract? Yes, so um, we do have one of our staff people, Thomas Corrales, I think he's, yeah, he's actually back there in the corner. He is sort of our technical guru. He goes out and works with all the contractors, helps them with any color matching, uh, issues they're having, if their uh, software is out of compliance or anything like that. Um, so he did go out and meet with CCAC a couple of weeks ago, helping them get back on track. Uh, our, our different coordinators do go out and monitor the work. When we start seeing issues of color matching, we try to bring it to the attention of the contractors. Um, you know, what, you know, the issues in Chinatown, you know, do seem to have been festering uh, for a while. Um, and, you know, like I, I stated previously, we have seen improvement. We will obviously continue to work with CCAC to monitor uh, their performance, their color matching, their ability to get out there and remove graffiti. Um, but, but OCB definitely agrees, you know, that, that by, by matching the color of a wall, you make the community look better. Your chances of having the graffiti reappear are a lot less, you know, I mean, we've probably all seen where that weird little patch ends up on a wall and it makes a perfect frame for the next tagger to come and tag right in there and it kind of becomes that cat and mouse. So, so no, no debate that, that color matching could and should improve. Agreed. Now, that being said as well, um, <laughs> just a couple of more comments and I'll, I'll see to my, my colleagues, I'll, I'll yield the rest of my time I'm taking up. Um, I think though there is Something to be said, Ms. Hayashi, directly to you about having so many events and so many visitors in Chinatown. I think that's a good thing. I think that is going to just keep coming. I think we want that. We want tourism there. We want folks to come to a pueblo. We want folks to come to Union Station. So it is a matter of trying to adjust and also keep up with the really difficult challenges we face, like the prevailing wage, which I know my, my fellow colleague, Commissioner Garcia, is working really hard to make sure that you guys can be as responsive as possible. So, I, you know, it's both sides, right? It's making sure OCB is holding you to account, making sure that we also give you the resources, but also planning for the future, knowing that the volume is just going to keep coming and it's not going to abate anytime soon. Um, that being said, uh, for the last time, uh, I, w I did talk to both uh, council districts, CD1 uh, and 13. They're both very satisfied. They know there's room for improvement, but they're very happy with the work of CCAC in that it might not be the right color 
it might uh, need, a, there's a lot of room for improvement as was said earlier, but uh, they are responsive because I think when the council office's eyes is get the tagging down immediately because that's what breeds other tagging, the broken windows theory. So that's appreciated. Um, but the last thing I'll say, and I promise it will be the last thing I say is, as I mentioned last week, I just wonder in places like MacArthur Park, in Westlake, in Pico Union, where there are no bids, where there are no other eyes and ears, um, are we holding those neighborhoods to the same standards as apparently everyone's holding Chinatown to? It's just something for us all to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cabello. Commissioner Garcia, then Commissioner Colosa. Um, I just want to allude to one thing, going back to Commissioner Cabello's uh, comments and questions. Paul, wouldn't we be able to help CCAC through this time, their transition time, through the machine that we have in our warehouse? And can our warehouse workers match for them their pain while they sort out their vendor situation? Is that something that we can do so that we don't go through this situation again? Yes, that, that, that would be an option so that until CCAC fully gets their uh, equipment up and running, uh, they can either come down and utilize our paint mixer or, or if uh, our warehouse staff has the time, uh, they might be able to, to mix some of the specific colors that are out there. So I think that's a, that's a good um, uh, the solution for now until CCAC can get their, their vendor and any other contractor that's not um, that has an issue with a vendor or their their painter mixer machine I think our warehouse should be a backup for that so that we don't produce that type of um, less than uh, perfect uh, excellence out in our community so what I want to say is that if any other vendor because we have about what four um, eight contractors I'm not sure how much 12. 12 contractors in total they can use our warehouse as a backup yes just for that. So that's just kind of the intermediate for this. And overall, I just want to say that I do support the summer jobs going to CCAC, especially that community. I said it last time we were on, on in public hearing. I'm saying it again. I don't dis disapprove that. I think we should just um, put some extra monitoring, monitoring on all of our subcontractors, not just CCAC, just to make sure that our color matching and that quality of service is up to par. And I Great. fully support Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. Commissioner Colosa. Thank you, President James. Um, thank you to CCAC for being here today, um, to Marianne, David, and all the youth for you know sharing your testimony. It was really helpful to hear from you directly and to um, really fully understand uh, how this program has impacted you in a, a positive way um, and, and the types of supports that it brings to, to you, you personally and your family. Um, and just so I can just uh, maybe, you know, separate two of these, two of these uh, issues that we're talking about. Um, I don't think, as my colleagues mentioned, you know, we're all fully supportive of, you know, summer youth and and this program. Um, but the summer youth don't necessarily do graffiti abatement, right? They focus on taking down the stickers and um, helping with litter abatement and all that they, stuff. They they help out with the graffiti removal and stuff as well. Um, but they wouldn't necessarily be the ones mixing up the paint or anything like that but but they are out there on some occasions working with the graffiti abatement contractors and might be might be removing graffiti using uh, you know off the back of stop signs or things like that or or rolling on balls or something so um and since i since my first two you know meetings with ccac one was a original meeting with executive director and um, uh, Richard, and then my, my drive along with um, David, can you explain, just so everyone's on the same page, what were some of the actions taken by OCB and some of, um, some of the, the other items to know in terms of progress? Uh, yeah, so we did, af after those first two meetings, um, you know, OCB was not fully satisfied with the uh, explanations as far as the uh, quality of the work being performed. And, and so we do, through the contracts, have the ability to uh, institute a corrective action plan, which we have done with CCAC. Um, we are working uh, closely with them on uh, improving the color matching, improving, uh, you know, response time really isn't a, a problem. It really is just the, the quality of the work and making sure that um, go, moving forward, they're doing a better job of color matching and secondarily going back to some of those walls that do have maybe two or three different colors on them and painting them so they are a standardized color 
that they can then use moving forward. Um, and then um, can you talk a little bit about next steps from our my drive through with David and what we agreed to do just so everyone's aware? So uh, we do have a uh, meeting scheduled, I believe, next week with uh, Chinatown BID, uh, Commissioner Colosa, OCB, and uh, Central City Action Committee, where we can kind of sit down, um, hopefully look back on some of the successes that we found, discuss some of the challenges, maybe find some of the ways that we can uh, uh, work better with the business improvement district in the area, um, but also, you know, keeping in mind that, um, you know, Chinatown is a, a portion of the area that they service, and the same guy that services Chinatown has to go all the way to Elysian Valley, and we can't neglect one part of the district uh, at the expense of another. So we do want to make sure that they are keeping that balance um, in, in getting requests taken care of wherever they come from, and doing color matching in all the areas uh, wherever those are as well. Um, and, and so you, do, you, do you agree that there's been a, an improvement, a commitment from CCAC to get all the necessary stakeholders at the table to really talk this through and, and try to ensure that there is a you know, positive outcome here for everybody, both from the city's perspective and also from the community's perspective? Yes. And I, just to add to that, I would agree, colleagues, I definitely see uh, an improvement from CCAC in that, you know, short amount of time, um, you know, the requests that we've been sending their way in terms of, you know, the uh, paint matching and walls um, have been improved, which I'm, you know, really happy to see. Um, and I think to, you know, Commissioner, you know, Cabello's point, and also Commissioner Garcia's, you know, it would be really um, helpful, I think, to see from OCB, um, you know, what measures we can take to ensure quality control for all neighborhoods in all communities and that, you know, uh, this came to my attention because I was walking through Chinatown and happened to be there, but I want to make sure that we are, um, as my colleagues mentioned, putting the same attention to all neighborhoods that, you know, may not have uh, the benefit of a bid. So, um, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rogers. Commissioner Davis, anything? Yeah, I just wanted to recap uh, some very good points made by Commissioner um, to, uh, by our Vice President, and that is, is that this discussion is really about matching specifically, and I appreciate the young men who've had great work experiences, and we encourage jobs, and unfortunately they weren't here on Friday when we did state that we want to make sure that we are in the business of creating jobs for young people, particularly in the summer. The mayor has a project where he hires at least 10,000 young people throughout this time, 15,000 now, uh, young people throughout the city. And certainly, we're in the business of creating jobs for young people, not taking them away. This hearing has never been about uh, the young people enjoying their jobs. We hope to create more of those. But it is about, on the other hand, uh, the matching and what we can do about it. And I think that uh, Commissioner Cabello raised the issue about a uniform approach to that value of matching throughout the city and how we achieve that. And of course, of course, Paul, that'll be something that uh, obviously the board and you will uh, implement uh, in the future. And I think that that's what this is about. And I just wanted the young people to know that we're very pleased to hear about their great experiences and that they should know that from the very beginning, our goal has always been to increase, hopefully, even jobs like this uh, as it relates to their employment. But as it also relates to matching colors we need to decide what our value is about that citywide. Great. Thank you. Um, anything further? Commissioner um, Garcia? Yes, I, I wanted to publicly thank C Central City Action Committee for going out on Saturday to our community cleanup at MacArthur Park. I thank you very much. I, I saw you guys in there doing your fully work. Uh, so with that, I know that the purpose of today's hearing is to pass the 50000 for the summer youth program, right? Um, so I, I put on the motion to pass that, to move that forward uh, with the conditions that we will respectively find a solution to color matching out in the community. And, and so I move to uh, fund our summer program. Thank you. I'll second it along with Commissioner Coloza and Commissioner Davis. Um, um, so without objection, that'll be the order on agenda item number four. Uh, thank you all for the participation. Uh, CCAC, thank you for coming in. Um, and we look forward to um, uh, 
uh, to not needing another longer hearing to talk <laughs> about uh, matching paint. Uh, so we appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Thank Raj. you. All right. Um, let's go to. Uh, Is that uh, item forthwith, Mr. President? Yes, forthwith Thank on you. number four. Um, so Mr. Raj can get his appropriations and all that uh, handled. Um, agenda item number. Uh, five um, is LaCrette's contract acceptance, Council District 14. Did we receive any speaker cards on number five? None, no. Recommending that the board accept the contract. Secondly, assess USS Cal Builders Incorporated with a penalty in the amount of $90,004.07 for the unauthorized subcontractor substitution of one bid listed SBE EBE subcontractor and author unauthorized use of one bid listed OBE subcontractor. Um, third, do not assess USS Cal with a penalty in the amount of $106,443.20 for the unauthorized subcontractor substitution of one bid listed OBE subcontractor. So again, it's assessing a penalty of 90K, not assessing a penalty of 106K. Withholding $2,145 in penalties from USS Cal for the, favor, for the following labor compliance violations. Failure of its subcontractor, Aero Concrete Cutting, to pay proper prevailing wages and training funds as this amount represents the final portion of the penalty from an assessment amount finalized under a signed settlement agreement between the city, USS Cal, and Aero. Fifth. Withhold $100,875 in disputed funds from USS Cal for failure to complete the punch list items associated with the commissioning of the project. Sixth, instruct the director of the Office of Accounting to disencumber the disputed funds, totaling $299,467.27 from the project fund, and the city to retain the assessed penalties and withholds, which is a total of $193,024.07 and instruct the Director of the Office of Accounting to release $106,443.20 in disputed funds to the contractor. Dr. Campos, do you need to add a recommendation number uh, or to revise recommendation number seven because of stop notice issues? I would. I'd like to make a friendly amendment to recommendation number seven to um, to hold some monies for five outstanding uh, stop notices. That total amount is $51,672.26, and then we also hold a 25% contingency for any unknown uh, variables, so a total of $64,590.33. So in general, that recommendation number seven of, would read, instruct the Director of Office of Accounting to release $106,443.20 minus, and this is the amendment, minus $64,590.33 for outstanding stop notices in the disputed funds to the contractor, and upon payment or release of any stop notices, authorize the release of any excess funds back to the contractor. So this gives us the flexibility to administratively take care of the releases as they come in, and then any excess funds can be returned back to the contractor, if any. Okay, the friendly amendment will be accepted as long as that's okay with Ms. Wiles and Mr. Cirillo. Okay. All right, Ms. Wiles, um, on number five, and Ms. McGlinchey is still with us today. <laughs> Good morning, Sefi Wiles, Bureau of Contract Administration. The LaCrette's Innovation Campus contract was awarded by this board to USS Cal Builders Incorporated, known as USS Cal, on June 19, 2013, in the amount of $21,114,233.37, with the contingency of $3,555,000 giving a total authorized budget of $24,669,233.37. The project is as complex as this board report, and the scope consists of converting an existing 56,000 square foot unreinforced masonry warehouse building into office and showroom spaces for the Department of Water and Power, and will house its smart grid demonstration project and LA clean tech. In September and November 2014 and March and December 2015, uh, this board approved additional contingencies uh, detailed in the board report, revising the authorized budget to 
there were 231 change orders issued increasing the contract amount by $9,976,293, bringing the total cost of this contract to uh, $31,090,526.37, $31 which was actually 47.25% above the awarded amount, but 2.09 below its authorized budget. This increase, again, the uh, complex project was due to construction costs, primarily because of the client's multiple uh, changes in scope of work, which included the HVAC, HVAC system, the build-out bays, the lighting system, IT equipment, and exhibit uh, displays. There were also unforeseen conditions, such as repairing larger sections of the existing brick walls than originally anticipated, and the replacement of an existing 18-inch storm drain system, as well as a um, modification to the large steel columns and extensive revisions to the electrical system. All work was completed and corrections uh, in December 22, 2016, which also included the commissioning uh, of the facility for the equipment, which incurred uh, additional uh, punch list items that were detailed in the recommendations. Uh, there was $395,936.12 in retention funds, less the disputed funds that were processed in July uh, 2017 via progress payment number 32. And then there were subsequent uh, release of uh, retention uh, disputed funds processed from November, December 2017, July of 2018, uh, when BCA received additional information to resolve those issues from uh, by Cal Bill, USS Cal. In November 2018, a final payment, uh, number 37, to release disputed funds in the amount of 60,000 was processed, and the remaining uh, outstanding balance of $299,467.27 were withheld pending the action by this board today. Uh, with respect to the business inclusion program, the original anticipated subcontractor participation percentages for this project were 10% MBE, 4% WBE, 25% SBE, 8% EBE, and 3% DVBE. USS Cal pledged 12.83% MBE, 0 at WBE, 50.78 SBE, 33.87 EBE, 0 DVBE, and 25.94 OBE. They achieved 8.21 MBE, 0 WBE, 25.89 SBE, 20.70 EBE, 0% DVBE, and 35.18 OBE. The MSM mandatory subcontracting minimum was 30%, the bidder pledged 73.50 and achieved 63.22%. Uh, lastly, the recommendations number two and four with, or with respect to the unauthorized substitutions uh, and labor compliance violations and uh, in addition to the uh, commissioning punch list items still remain unresolved and OCC and BOE can speak on that if needed. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Wiles. Ms. McGlinchey? You fooled me, I was heading over there to your reserve seat. Um, so, okay, we've dealt with a number of hearings over the years on this and we have kind of a closeout uh, request to accept the contract, correct? Correct. And this is kind of what everybody has worked in, including our friendly amendment from Dr. Campos regarding outstanding stop payment notices, potentially. Um, both, well, US, USS Cal Builders, uh, the subject of the penalties and the withholds, they were aware of the hearing this morning, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, neither they nor their lawyers are here this morning. Um, would you just provide a summary um, for us um, of kind of the justification for the um, the ninety thousand in the penalty? Granted, it's in the board report, but the oral report should reflect it. Um, the penalty assessment of one hundred and six thousand, and then. Um, if you or someone else here wants to talk about the issue on the punch list items, uh, uh, that would 
be helpful for the oral record as well. Okay. Uh, we have three subcontractors that when everything was said and done, we had issues with in terms of the parameters of the contract. Uh, fire sprinkler design construction had been bid listed to uh, for a total of $771,250. Prior to award, we looked at it. We knew that there was an issue. They, uh, they had put down the wrong dollar amount. However, they did not follow the public contract code in asserting a clerical error in a timely manner. So as we sort of discussed in our previous uh, agenda item, we, are, we have to hold them to the dollar amount in their bid proposal. The contractor ended up, the, this subcontractor ended up performing $240,000 $699.19, so th there's quite a bit of a difference there. The, uh, and so we're recommending the penalty of $77,125 as it relates to this subcontractor. HM Carpet, and f uh, also known at, or doing business as HM Flooring Group, was bid listed to perform flooring work totaling $92,916. Uh, in their bid proposal documents, the, con the contractor listed another subcontractor to also do that flooring work in addition to other work. The public contract code requires uh, in the instance where two subs are listed for the same work that the prime must then perform the work. So that was uh, noted in the award board report that the prime would have to do this work. However, the uh, USS Cal Builders ultimately used HM carpet, carpet to do that work even though they were required by the public contract code to do the work themselves. Therefore, we're recommending a penalty of $12,879.70. That comes to our total recommended, the two of those add up to our total recommended penalty of $90,004.07. The remaining subcontractor is Digital Networks Group. They were bid listed to perform a low voltage uh, work totaling $1,064,432. The bulk of their subcontract work was tied up with a fixed cost item that the city had valued at only $250,000 worth of work. Uh, after the award, the contractor, uh, along with engineering, worked together to value engineer that work, and they ended up uh, working with the sub and reducing the value of that work to about $347,000. That the city approved that, the contractor paid the subcontractor for that value of work. However, that value of work was still more than the fixed cost item that the city had allotted for, which was $250,000. Therefore, there was no deduct change order that could be applied to this subcontractor's work, which created a situation of a potential penalty of $106,443.20. For these reasons, the city got what it needed in terms of the work. Uh, it was value engineered and the subcontract amount was reduced with city approval, although there was no change order deducting from the contract we are recommending that that penalty be waived. Okay. Um, and then the, the $100,875 um, on the punch list items. Good morning, Jose Fuentes, Bureau of Engineering, Construction Management Division. We manage the construction of this project from 2013 through 2016. Uh, at the conclusion of construction and during the commissioning phase of the project, um, several items were identified that were not completed by the contractor. These were notified uh, in writing to them. 
Also, our commissioning agent identified a list of deficiencies that needed to be corrected in order for the commissioning report to be completed. Those items were also transmitted to the contractor. The contractor could not get their subcontractors to return and correct these items or finish the items. Uh, we subsequently corresponded with them again and itemized uh, the items in detail. We also provided a cost estimate of what it would take the city to complete these items. Um, they hired an attorney and that attorney uh, corresponded with BOE. Uh, they disputed all of the items. We reviewed that correspondence and determined that our first assertion of that those items being required were actually found in the contract. So we provided all the contractual information to justify our position and withholding that money. Uh, since then, we have not heard back. This was a year ago. Um, we are recommending that we withhold the amount for seven items that are still uh, incomplete. The total of that is 100875 and this money will be used by DWP to hire vendors to complete the work. And so that's our request. Okay, um, then um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we, and I've confirmed they knew about the hearing this morning, obviously, well, I'm making an assumption. I, but I can, I can say for certain, I communicated with the senior vice president. He told me he read the report and he was disappointed at the finding. And that was it. Okay, I told so him. they know about it, they didn't come, they're disappointed, but they're not sending their lawyers in. Uh, uh, okay, um, and um, uh, well that's a decision they can make. They didn't respond uh, after a year, uh, according to you, uh, in response to our further response. So. It's been out there for some time. Uh, I'm com I, I recognize that USS Cal is disappointed. Um, I'm sure they're disappointed that their subs wouldn't, uh, wouldn't complete the work themselves either. But our responsibility, our contract is with the prime, um, and that's where we have to go for these kinds of things. Um, so um, any questions? I'll make a motion that we adopt agenda item number five as amended, uh, seconded by Commissioner Garcia, Coloza, and Davis as amended. Any objection? Without objection, that will be the order. Any issue sending it forthwith? We'll send number five forthwith. Thank you all. Um, agenda item number two, um, I think is our final voting item this morning. Task order solicitation SN49 amendment number six, Arcadis um, from sanitation, recommending that the board authorize the Director of LA Sanitation and Environment, or as designee to issue Amendment Number 6 to Task Order Solicitation SN29 to Arcadis U.S. Incorporated, increasing uh, the budget from $830,000 to $4,470,670, including a 10% contingency, and extending the term of engagement to July 22, 2019, for continuing, this is in Council District 1, by the way, for continuing the development of the Clean Water Campus, including evaluating financial benefits of entering into a partnership between the City of Los Angeles and Goodwill Southern California Industries. And secondly, contingent upon approval by the Board of Public Works of the five-year renewal of the parent on-call contract as authorized by Council File 13-0949-S1, authorize the Director of Sanitation or his designee to extend this toss to December 31, 2022. This has been continued before. Mr. Hare, welcome back. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Com commissioners, my name is Scott Hare. I'm with the Bureau of Sanitation. And yes, we're, we're asking for um, a board approval of this amendment to an existing contract with Arcadis for the Clean Water Campus building. Um, this amendment is primarily to cover um, items as we move forward with a uh, P3 form of delivery in partnership with Goodwill. Um, and yes, this has been continued from about two weeks ago when I was last up here. Um, in I general- would, uh, Also just note for the record that uh, Ms. Hoppenstand uh, uh, from the city attorney's office uh, who works on sanitation matters is here as well. So go ahead. Uh, uh, rather than go over everything again, I figured I would quickly address the specific items that were that caused some confusion the last time uh, I was here. The um, items in uh, particular were on page nine, and I think you've been uh, distributed a uh, amended version. 
uh, prim the primary point of uh, confusion was under the, pro the PRC approval uh, when we stated that the uh, budget of 56 million had been approved by PRC. Um, the more correct way to word that was the, uh, the construction cost of 49 million is what PRC officially approved. The additional seven million was authorized and budgeted, but was not officially approved by PRC. It looks like they officially approved capital costs. So it's more accurate to say that additional seven million was budgeted. Um, and then uh, late, later on, a, another issue came up regarding the table and statement as to funds. Uh, it, was, it was noticed that the total of the table did not add up to the total budget for the project. Um, the statement as to funds merely listed the remaining funding. So to uh, kind of add a little clarity to the table, we added a line for prior years to uh, um, cover all money that had been spent to date. When added to the additional funds, it now adds up to the total budgeted amount um, or total amount being requested for budget. Which is the, so the table, the $4,470,670 is broken down by the 830000 in prior years and then starting with the, um, the amounts for subsequent years, including $2.5 in the upcoming current fiscal year, correct? Correct. Okay. So I don't know if there were any other particular uh, points of concern that needed to be addressed. Um, Commissioner Colosa? Um, no, I don't have any additional questions at this time. You know, thank you for making the correction and uh, clarifying uh, the difference between the first budget uh, report where it stated 56 million, now this states the, the correct amount of 49 million, so. Um, but I don't have any other questions at this time. I would still note, if it's 49 million, that's the number, 49 million? It says 49,000. Yes, I was just going to make that point oh, for okay. the record. Yeah, we need to get that clear again. In the, uh, in the red ink. The one pager you handed us. Okay, oh, okay, yes. Record, that should be 49 million. Thank yes. you. Estimated okay. construction cost of 49 million, an additional seven million was budgeted for planning, design, construction okay. management, and purchasing land. Yeah. Okay, we can. Uh, get that corrected. Let's to get that typo million. corrected. But that, that's in the area. And the reason I saw it, because when I read it the first time, I didn't see it, um, was uh, related to the, the question of PRC, that's Program Review Committee approval versus budgeting. So this says, I'm just going to read it in the record. On March 11, 2015, the, pub, the Program Review Committee approved the estimated construction cost of $49 million, and the additional $7 million was budgeted for planning, design, construction management, and purchasing land. Okay. Was that $7 million approved by the PRC, or is that added on that's not actually approved by the PRC, and that the approval by the PRC was $49 million? From the way it was explained to me, we, the soft costs are a function of the hard cost and PRC sees them as uh, incidentals. So their, I guess, their so the purpose is, is to actually approve hard cost. So the budgeted, the total budget is, gets approved as a function of approving the hard cost the other gets approved, but you can't say it's approved officially. It's it's budgeted let once try, the hard costs are approved. Is $49 million approved by the PRC? Yes. Okay. I've got a yes from you and from Ms. Hoffenstan. Okay. So the additional seven, so $49 million is approved. The additional $7 million um, is budgeted, but not yet approved by the PRC. It is, from our perspective, it's approved. Okay. But from their perspective, they do not officially approve 
the remainder. The remainder is approved as a result of PRC approving the $49 million in hard costs. Okay, so now let's go to this. The, does that $7 million, whether or not the PRC says we approve 49, sanitation says, ah, actually you approve 49 plus the soft costs, maybe there's a dispute there, um, but does, does the PRC approval of the additional $7 million and Mr. Jordan, this is for you and for uh, and for Ms. Hoppenstand. Does the PRC um, approval of the additional seven million, one way or the other, does that affect our ability to uh, to uh, pass uh, or approve the four million that we're talking about today? No. Okay, I didn't think so. Um, okay, um, I, I, I agree. I don't. I don't see that it would. Okay, so I I think that we can approve the four million that you're talking about today, but for the larger scope of the project, it's at some point it's probably going to be helpful to have cleared up the issue of, as you termed it, and I think it was termed a couple of weeks ago, the soft costs. Because there's got to be a way that better explains it for everyone and makes it a little more clear. Yes, I, I spent a lot of time with our financial management division trying to get a, a clear definition and um, that was the best I got was that PRC's mandate is to approve uh, capital cost. So they officially approve capital cost and therefore when the minutes are created, they only reflect PRC's approval of the capital cost. In other words, they never approve these other ancillary items. That was how it was explained to me. But those are approved by our financial management division as a result of PRC's approval of the hard costs. They, they authorized all the other budget, which we asked for simultaneously. They authorized that budget, that money is budgeted and we are authorized to spend it. Um, but technically, from what I understand, PRC only approves the hard costs. Okay, Commissioner Cabell? Just curious as to what the difference between these soft costs are and what actually is contingency. Contingency, um, the, the soft cost is when we go to uh, get budget. Soft cost is any money that would be spent on the planning or the construction management. Um, so non-construction costs. Yeah, they're, okay. they, they're not going to be incorporated okay. in the finished product. They are. And they PRC are requirements of providing the finished product. Got it, got it. No, I understand that. So PRC is solely approving the actual hard construction costs and anything yes. above and beyond it. So it's not the total budget, essentially, of the project. It's just the capital costs. Yes. Okay. I'd yes. like to thank you for the clarification, please. Thank you. And it and we can, it, that, that approval doesn't affect us one way or the other on what we do today. No, the money um, that we have come here and asked for today has already been um, budgeted for. Um, so yes, all, all the money that is, is in this um, amendment is currently budgeted for. So the money is available. Okay. Um, Commissioner Cabello. Oh, yes. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you. I just have a clarifying question and maybe I'm confused somehow. Um, don't we need the budgeting, planning, design, and construction management and purchasing of the land before we actually have a construction budget? And or how does this work? Because I'm hearing, I'm reading here, seven million was budgeted for planning, design, construction, management, and purchasing land. Don't we have to have that first before we can actually go into construction? Uh, y yes. But we, you're saying we here asked that it's not approved. That seven million was not approved. It was authorized and budgeted, but PRC didn't actually approve it. But it was all, from our perspective, it was all approved. We, we were uh, given a budget of $7 million for uh, So planning how did we come up with um, $49 million for construction without the first part? We, that is something we do with overhead money. We did an initial cost estimate with using overhead in order to get the remainder for the project budgeted. So when we actually spend whatever time we spend doing a cost estimate on the project, that is done without actual 
project money that's done with overhead money um, because we don't have a project budget to, but to build to yet. So yes, I mean, it's a very, very small amount of time and therefore a, it's a very small amount of money, but it is billed to an overhead work order number because we don't actually have project budget to build to at that moment. And is this uh, something you guys do routinely, yes. very often? Whenever we have to do, uh, when we have, we have to come up with a cost estimate for a new project, yeah, un until we have the new project authorized, we st the, any work that goes into it, such as coming up with the cost estimate for that, has to be done with a general overhead money. Okay. Yeah. And the, pro the program review committee, no matter what they're reviewing, would not be approving the soft costs whether it's this project or any project. That's how I understand it. They don't actually approve the soft costs officially. Okay, no. and either you or Mr. Jordan or Ms. Hoppenstand, uh, who, who makes up the program review committee? Does it vary from project to project? Or is there it's, this group called the PRC? Yeah. yeah. Right, so your microphone, Mr. Cirillo. So It's Sanitation Student Executives and one representative from Bureau of Engineering, Ken Red. Okay. And, the, and it is a body that sits? Monthly. Monthly. Okay. Um, and the people change occasionally? Uh, generally not, unless there's somebody that leads the organization or moves on. Okay, and your, your representative is Ken Red. It is. Okay. Um, and so it would be, you know, I think what might be helpful for all of us is for Ken Red and maybe a sanitation representative from the committee to just come in and do an oral report about the PRC and what they do and who they are and and just give us some examples of what they approve and what they don't approve and, uh, process. and the process because that way whenever these things come before us you won't have to provide the background that can result in some confusion so that yeah, I agree that and would yeah. probably be quite helpful yeah and everybody knows well everybody will know kind of what we're doing so um, uh, Mr. Campos, you'll, you'll uh, uh, arrange that oral report for us. Yes. Gra great. Well, I'm still com go Commissioner Cabello. No, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say, with all the brass that we have here today and the e updated explanation, I'm comfortable, and the fact that this, the PRC limits on their approvals doesn't affect our ability to approve this today, I'm willing to go ahead and make a motion on agenda item number two today. Uh, but, but Mr. Mr. President, President, you stole my thunder. I was actually going to move as amended, and I will, I'm happy to have you second. Okay, I'll second that motion. <laughs> Thank you. Any objection? Without objection, uh, we will uh, adopt agenda item number two as amended. Any issue sending number two as amended forthwith? We'll send number two as amended forthwith. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, and we look forward to our PRC presentation. <laughs> um, agenda item number 13 is our oral report this morning. Um, Mr. Monte, quarterly project labor agreements update from the Bureau of Contract Administration. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner James. First off, appreciate everyone's patience and waiting for this part of the program. I know this is the highlight or not, but it's fine. Again, I uh, want to say good morning. Uh, is it still good morning or is it good afternoon now? It's good afternoon per uh, board member well, Ted I Jordan. I said it would be noon, but it's 12.02. <laughs> All, All right. right. Go ahead. So again, good afternoon, uh, commissioners, board members, and bureau representatives. Again, my name is Ian Monte, and I am representing the Bureau of Contract Administration Office of Contract Compliance, where I'm going to provide a uh, the quarterly report for the project labor agreement uh, for the Department of Public Works. And so what this report is going to be is going to be a comprehensive update of the achievements of cover projects under both the previous and the current PLAs. Uh, it's going to be a quarterly update also from February 26th through the present, which is going to immediately follow the previous reporting period, which I will discuss a little bit later. Uh, and the way that this report is going to go, I know the handout was circulated, I know the way that this report is going to go is we're going to do just a, a very quick synopsis of current and upcoming projects. We're going to look at targeted hiring achievements, we're going to look at local wages reinvested, and then we're going to talk about quarter milestones from that February 26th to the present period. 
Uh, all of the information that I'm going to be discussing has been uh, derived from real-time statistical project data, which ultimately comes from certified payrolls that contractors send to us through our online certified payroll system, which we then take and then uh, quantify the data using uh, Microsoft Power BI software, which produces some of the graphics that you guys see before you. Uh, this dashboard information, all of this information that I'm going to be discussing is real time truly because it updates every morning at 6.30 in the morning. So this data is as current as yesterday. So very quickly, uh, first I want to talk about covered projects. Currently we have 96 covered projects which total $1.27 billion awarded by this Board of Public Works. Active, you have 56 projects which total $1.01 billion. Board accepted, you have 32 projects totaling 129 million. Administratively closed is seven projects totaling 119 million. And there is one project now deemed canceled in the amount of $8 million, which is the Central Los Angeles Recycling and uh, Transfer Station Phase One. Also upcoming, we have 37 projects that will be occurring. Uh, you have seven that are, uh, have been awarded and are in some various phase of about to begin construction totaling $61 million. You have to be awarded three projects totaling $16 million and to be advertised within the next 12 months, you have 27 projects totaling $314 million. Moving to targeted hiring achievements where we have the targeted hiring requirements of the project labor agreement and I will talk about each requirement as I get to uh, the actual progress of them. Um, these targeted hiring achievements are based on 14,152 workers that have performed 3,576,520 hours over all of the covered projects that uh, I've d discussed currently. So first we have the targeted local hire uh, requirement, which is at least 30% of all project hours must be performed by a city resident. So with that achievement, uh, as of yesterday, we have a total of 1,362,520 hours that were performed uh, by local residents, which represents 38% on that 30% goal. However, the, in my opinion, the coolest part about this is you have 4,115 workers, which represent 29% of the workforce. So what you have is 29% of the workers performing 38% of the work. That's great. Going to local resident apprentice where you have a 50% where at least 50% of all of the apprenticeship hours need to be performed by a local resident apprentice. You have 490,966 hours of 795, 828 total apprentice hours, which represents 62% hours worked by local apprentice on that 50% goal. However, again, Staying with the cool part of this, you have 1,624 actual apprentices, local apprentices of 303,583 total apprentices, which represents 45% of the apprentices working, have done 62% of the work. And then finally, the disadvantage, and then in the 2015 to 2020 project labor agreement was uh, deemed a transitional worker, there is a 10% of all of the project hours performed need to be performed by somebody that meets the criteria of transitional or disadvantaged worker uh, on the project. And you have uh, transitional workers and disadvantaged workers have performed 696,435 hours or 19% of the hours on the 10% goal. But again, staying with the coolness, you have 898 total workers, which represents 6% of the total workforce that have performed 19% of the work. So again, 6% of the workers have performed 90% of the work under the transitional and disadvantaged uh, heading. Local wages reinvested, we have just over $47 million uh, reinvested back into the city of Los Angeles through local workers performing work on these 96 covered projects. And that amounts to journey level wages of 35.13 million, 35 million and apprenticeship wages of the 11.99 million. So if somebody would like to contribute $10,000, $10, we'll get them right over the threshold to 12 million. 
So I want to turn very quickly, and I have a lot of data here, so to kind of stay brief, I'm not going to go a deep dive into all of the data that I have, which would be available on, on question and answer. So quarter milestones, again, we're going to go back to this quarter period, which is February 26th through May 28th. And all of this data is based on 1,510 workers, including 314 apprentices performing 133,343 hours uh, on active projects. So very, very, very quickly, first we have 436 local resident workers that have performed 50,881 local hire hours, or 38% of the total hours performed. That's an actual increase from the previous reporting period, which was November 27th through February 25th, of 6,063 hours, a 14% increase, and a worker difference of 36 workers, or a 9% increase. For local apprentice, you have 165 local resident apprentices who have performed 20,749 hours of 30,727 total apprentice hours, or a whopping 68% of the work on these projects. That is in comparison to last uh, reporting period where we had 138 local resident apprentices who performed 15,506 hours. For again, a, a, and a Oh, excuse me, a percentage increase of 34% of the hours and 20% of the workers. The disadvantaged slash transitional workers have seen 89 disadvantaged transitional workers performing work during this period, where 17,863 of the 50,881 local hire hours, or actually 35% of those hours were performed by transitional workers, or 13% of the total number of hours that was provided. And again, this is in comparison to 67 disadvantaged slash transitional workers who performed 13,651 hours, which is an increase of 31% for the hours and 33% for the actual workers. Finally, we have $1.86 million reinvested back into the city, into our communities, where journey level wages were $1.32 million and apprenticeship wages were 537 and $60, which is an increase of $200,000 and or 12%. Finally, uh, before I go to Q&A, we've had eight apprentices graduate to journey level on these projects over the last three months. So with that and all of this data, I open it up to questions for you all. Thank you, Mr. Monte. Curiosity, eight apprentices graduated to journey level um, this uh, quarter. How many do, is is there an average per quarter that you have? I do not have an average per quarter. The last quarter saw only four graduate. So, and there oh, so was you had obviously a hundred percent increase. Huh? Say it again. You had a hundred. Well, you had a you had a hundred percent increase. We did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. So, but what I can do is I can go back and I can take a look at the last five quarters and just kind of get an average, and then that way we can speak into future uh, trends. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, trends are helpful. Not a problem. Um, Commissioner Garcia. Um, well, I was going to ask a similar question as President James regarding. Well, I read your mind he already. He sure did. <laughs> so, um, is it is it fair to say that we're taking the eight out of the 165 local resident apprentices? No. So, okay. um, because these are not necessarily eight local apprentices. Got it. To be honest, uh, we did an analysis, and I wasn't comfortable with the analysis to come and talk about specifically how many were local versus non-local in this particular session. I can certainly go back and do that, but what I didn't want to do is uh, report something that was false. And so if you would like, I can certainly provide that to you and the rest of the board members in terms of how many were actually local. But in this particular instance, it's eight uh, apprentices graduated to journey level by performing work on at least one of these uh, active PLA projects during this period. Got it. Okay. No, I think this is great. It is fantastic. I I saw the difference between an apprentice and a journeyman's hourly rate, and I think these folks now have a really good um, uh, position in their life. So I, I'm happy for all these uh, companies that are um, inputting and in, in making this happen. So I don't know if we have a specific on who's doing such a great job in transitioning folks into from apprentice to journeyman, but I think it's fantastic. I just want to say that. 
So maybe as you elaborate more with your findings, you can just send me a quick note on who, what are the, the most um, companies that are producing more of this. I will take a look at that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Anything else? Uh, Commissioner Colosa. Thank you, President James. Um, I know, thank you for sharing this and for all your metrics. It's really helpful. Um, I know you're tracking specifically the numbers with PLA. Um, I was wondering if we track internally with BCA, like the gender equity numbers, just because, you know, um, it would be really helpful maybe to see that, um, you know, uh, maybe you can chat offline about what they look like and trying to get more women into these non-traditional fields. So speaking with gender equity, we are currently refining our uh, project labor agreement dashboard, which will include demographics, which will show not only female workers, but actually being able to break them down by craft and apprenticeship and even what apprentice level that they are currently at. And that will certainly give you all of the same data that we are currently providing. So you will still be able to see the wages reinvested um, as it relates to uh, female workers. OCPS um, defaulted to the male uh, gender just when, with entering payrolls and it's something that we've since corrected. We, we identified that maybe a year and a half ago. And so we wanted to ensure that everyone that was entering certified payrolls had the opportunity to select and identify workers that were female as female so they could certainly get credit. That most comes into play when you're dealing with federal projects that have a 6.9% of project hours to be performed by female workers requirement. Um, the current PLA does not have such a requirement. I'm not sure if le legally we can put a certain requirement like that in there, but certainly something that we're looking to track and we certainly have the ability to track it. I just never include that particular piece into the quarterly board report because again, it's not an actual metric of the project labor agreement itself. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else, Commissioner Davis? Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to ask, often when we have a lot of our PLAs implemented on our construction projects, they often help us to not only provide employment, but also to achieve diversity in terms of the various communities that get to work on a project. Oftentimes, by the time we put a PLA in it, it helps make that project more diverse. Is that still true? It absolutely is true. Um, one of the things that we really strive for at BCA is we're very much into, and I'm gonna quote John Reamer when we start talking about the recruitment, the retention, and ultimately the graduation of apprentices, because that's about giving career opportunities to all Angelinos, regardless of what their uh, ethnic uh, breakdown or which community they reside. But with that being said, there's certainly work that can be done uh, you know, uh, in different communities um, where they, there obviously is underrepresentation. Um, we've done a lot of outreach where sometimes it's not just about going and, and passing out uh, job applications or trying to connect contractors, it's just about going and learning about the community. A uh, couple of things in particular I do want to mention. We got in contact with someone that sits on the Proposition HHH Citizens Oversight Committee who runs a homeless resource event every Wednesday at Mount Tabor Church in South LA. And when we got uh, notification of that, we sent two staff members just to go. We're not going to talk about workforce right now. We wanna see what's happening with this particular sector of the community that, oh, by the way, is in the PLA under transitional workers as documented homeless. And we wanted just to see what was happening, where these individuals are. Is there an opportunity to actually start talking workforce development with them at that level or do we need to find out who is serving them there and then what level they go to after that and then maybe spark a conversation there. Uh, we're actively involved with the Jordan Downs workforce uh, development meetings that occur every month at Jordan Downs and that's a predominantly African American housing community. Now the Board of Public Works did uh, approve and uh, accepted uh, the Century Boulevard extension project which is actually great. Um, it really has revitalized that community and because I saw it from the start of that project to where it is now and it looks markedly different regardless of the housing that's there. But we are actively involved in that because one of the things that we do is we talk to 
the contractors that are there, because they're not only just working on the Jordan Downs projects, we talk to them about the public works PLA opportunities. And we, we interact with those that are helping serving that community, putting them through pre-apprenticeship programs. And we recently certified the entity known as Career Expansions that's doing their own MC3 program and graduated 18 local African-American uh, students and from a pre-apprenticeship program. We've now certified them as one of our 10 uh, PLA jobs coordinators because that's a resource that we can absolutely use to help funnel the African-American uh, populace to our projects to create more diversity. So those are just two instances of uh, BCA just kind of reaching out and just going a step above and beyond just to, to tackle diversity and really just trying to give everyone an opportunity, as you would say, Commissioner Davis, to work in this city. And I'm glad to hear that, and I know that we've had underrepresentation in some cultures in the city, and oftentimes, again, PLA has helped us to achieve that, I think, to Commissioner Go uh, Car uh, Cardoza's, uh, Caloza's, uh, I'm sorry, Carlosa's uh, point, uh, making sure that we have women included in that too. That's such a critically important, or let's say equally important variable that hopefully the uh, PLA will embrace. And then um, in addition to that, I wanted to finally say that I hope that uh, our geographic goals also can be equally, and you have spoken to that today, but we wanna make sure that we continue to focus on making sure that the various different silos within the city get an equal opportunity, if at all possible, to be included in the PLAs too, from East LA to South Central, et cetera, et cetera, from Pacoima, you name it. Uh, so we appreciate the work that you have done and uh, we can see some market improvement this uh, quarter uh, and pleased to see that we are also keeping the fire burning on transitional workers as well. So thank you for the report. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further? The oral report will be received. Thank you, Mr. Monte. Uh, Dr. Campos, have we cleared the desk? Yes, you have. Well, then we are adjourned this Wednesday morning. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.